Joining me now in studio is Van Taylor. It's a pleasure to have you on the show and learn more about everything you've done for Buffalo over the last 49 years or so. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. And it's really uh, my pleasure, my privilege to uh, uh, sit right here next to you and share what stories I can. And But how you pick me is the, the question. It's like, where did that come from? <laughs> yes, yeah, so we have a nomination form right on our website, you know, thegooddeedsbuffalo.tv. But Kaz Rodriguez actually nominated you. A gentleman and a scholar he is. Yes, he is. Thank yes. you, Cass. When did, you, when did your love for music start? Uh, early, very early. And my father played piano, my brothers played piano, so I really started playing piano at age five. Oh, age five. Age five. Age yes. five. So, more so, when did your love for jazz start? That's an interesting story. Yeah. Um, because uh, here's the catch. I didn't start playing jazz and R&B. I started playing polka music. Okay, polka music. Okay. Yeah. I grew up in a Polish neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> so I was surrounded by polka music 24-7. So I could get an accordion out and do whatever polka you wanted. I was right there. Mm. But here's the, the catch, though. Polka music has a lot of different forms, especially with the horn lines. Okay. And I fell in love with that. So it started out with polka music. Then I went to... Latin music. Latin music, wonderful. Okay, that was the next phase. Yeah. And the similarity in the horn lines were very just very much the same. So you were seeing a similarity then in yeah, the music. Yeah, it was very easy to connect the dots. And then from there, pretty much blues, blues. Uh, then country. Country, The connection okay. between country, I played a lot of country. Um, overseas, my first gig was country gig. But um, the similarity with country and blues and old time gospel is one in the same. One in the same. So jazz actually came last. Jazz came last for you. Came but when last. you were doing those other those other genres, you quickly connected them. It was easy. Yeah. You know, uh, music is a universal language. It universal really honestly is. is. You can hear, I've been to Africa several times, so Greece and other places I've traveled throughout the world. Mm -hmm. But I hear the similarity in all the music no matter where I go. Doesn't matter what language you speak. A bad singer is a bad singer, a great <laughs> singer is a great singer, and you don't have to understand the language, but you understand the vibe and the feel. Yeah. How was it opening for sh opening shows for talents like Natalie Cole, Gladys Knight, and Cool and the Gang? Well, um, I, I, for me, it's kind of different. Uh, I would say this. Um, I looked at people as people, whether it was Natalie Cole or Gladys Knight or, or the, the gentlemen in Cool and the Gang, because they used to practice here in Buffalo, and they also played oh, right. here a lot in Buffalo. Yeah. Um, and Natalie used to practice here on, when she was on tour, she would stop, and we ended up being her opening act. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, at the Colored Musicians Club. And uh, we got tied up with uh, Gladys Knight and a, a number of acts that we, we followed LaBelle, um, that group LaBelle. And, um, but I always treated people as people, so I wasn't blown away by, this is so-and-so. Mm -hmm. They still were people 24-7, no matter what they did and how they are but they had the, the blessings and the gift of entertainment. And that passed on to me to tackle the music. Yeah. Learn the music and then entertain your, your audience and your guests. The entertainment business is a business. Yeah, You for don't sure. have to just play. It's a lot of people involved, so one band could employ 300 people easily. Oh, wow. People don't look at it that I way. I didn't realize that. Sure, but yeah. you take a band, go play a club, that's the club. The mm -hmm. club has staff that operates that club. People come into the club and sit down. You got food, you got the cooks, you got the waiters, you got the waitresses, it's all being paid. You got to get there, you got to park. That's a whole other part of it. Yep, so there's okay. already so many people there. There's right. already a couple people there. So yeah. in my group, Taylor Made Jazz Play, we come to say uh, Milan or we go to uh, Naples in Italy, right? We just put maybe 30,000 people to work. Wow. From the moment of the airport, to the train, to the cab, to the hotels. Every city has the same thing. Buffalo, uh, when there's a big concert, and you look at the big boom now that our politicians have learned to grab and grasp yeah. cultural stuff, right? The cultural stuff, Because yeah, sure. somebody had to explain to them, one group coming to town, you just put every hotel to work, every restaurant to work. All I the see. people that support all of that, same thing. And it kind of leads me into my next question um, a little bit. Do you think music has the ability to connect our community? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, some of the uh, big, bigger venues or even the smaller venues, uh, I think in tourism in reverse. When I go to other cities, 
Why do I go? I'm going to check out the entertainment. But people come here, and it may be on the east side. It may be on the west side. It could easily be on the south side. But the point is you're coming for the music, mm -hmm. and you're coming for the atmosphere of that community and how it represents and presents itself. The music has a, such a strong way to bring us together, being a universal language, no matter what genre listen to, it can certainly bring Buffalo together. Well, absolutely. I so. mean, they always had these big events, polka events at the yep. Central Terminal for years. Polka events, wonderful. Right. And, and everybody goes I and has a good it. old time. I loved it. Yeah. Okay. And people were like, you like polka? Oh, <laughs> come on now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get out there on the floor with you. No, it's wonderful. Now. As a role model to so many, how do you keep the community positive and, and upbeat, the community that you interact with? Well, that's not that hard. It, it's um, the moment you wake up in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you wake up with a smile. Uh, somebody could be having a bad day, all righty? And no matter what it is, if you smile, it may stretch them a little bit to smile back, but eventually they will. Okay, mm -hmm. or a kind word, always a kind word, because you don't know what that other person is going through that day, Very or, true. or something else they might be not going through or not telling. And um, a compliment doesn't hurt, you That's know. True. People are quick to attack and say something bad, but what about how about just say something good and something nice? Very true. You know? So just starting that the, your the from, from the moment from your, you wake moment up, moment we wake up, have a smile on your face and try to to think positively. That's exactly about the it. Day. And if maybe even if your day is not going that well, try to help someone else have a good day. That's too. right. And okay. it'll eventually it'll come back your way. Sure, it, it always does. Now, can you tell me some of your favorite memories from the fundraisers you've held from over the years? Oh wow! Because uh, I know you've been in quite a few. Quite a few. Uh, the Jerry Lewis telethons were exciting to me. Um, they had the big division, but we had a Buffalo division uh, that should be at the, um, now it's called the Millennium, it was Sheridan uh, that time, mm -hmm. but working with all the different people there. Now here's the thing about it, it's a small community, a small world, because you got the Variety Club Telethon as well. That one had a huge impact on my life because I loved working with it, watching the kids, especially the kids, but knowing that the money that you're helping raising will help so many other families, Yeah. okay? But then as you start looking around, you notice that whether the fundraisers over here for Roswell mm -hmm. or Children's Hospital, a lot of it still is the community as a whole coming trying together. to coming together to try to make something happen. We did the Roswell thing in 2004, and uh, again, people with cancer and, and things like that. So my group has always supported charities of all types, okay. as long as it was good to the community and good for the community. And then the key is the musicians I surround myself with, so it's not just me. Yeah, I can go do a show, but then you got to look, there's maybe 30 people behind me with the same attitude, yeah. the See, same to disposition back. to give back. So now I've got an entire orchestra really behind me mm -hmm. doing different things at different times with the same common goal, to give back. Yeah, and you actually, so you performed on the Variety Buffalo Telethon in 2019 yes. with your tailor-made jazz tour with the music on the front lines. Yes. How was, how was that experience? Oh, it was beautiful. Beautiful? Uh, we hadn't done it in a while, and, and, it was, and it was just an incredible experience when John gave me a call and said, hey, how about this? Yeah. I loved it, you know? Mm -hmm. And the whole crew was like, no hesitation. When and where do we need to be? Okay, but we, I can go back to the 80s. I can mm -hmm. go back a little bit further than that with the Variety <laughs> Club Telethon. Yeah. And it was always exciting. Was but most exciting. importantly, like you said, you've seen Buffalo to come, coming together for these events, regardless of the charity. Buffalo came together to be the city of good neighbors. And yes. that is wonderful. Now, you are the former president of the Historic Colored Musicians Club. How did that come about and how did you get involved? Well, I've been involved since the uh, 70s. I went there to learn jazz. Jazz, yeah. And uh, it was kind of funny because the story I'll share with you one day is it starts with the Variety Club Telethon. It really does. But it really starts with the Variety Club Telethon. But I went there to learn jazz and did not learn jazz. <laughs> okay. So you didn't learn the jazz. I didn't but that's learn what the you jazz, went there for. But that's what I went there for. <laughs> and the thing was is that the uh, president of that time, Katrina Wright, was looking toward the future. And she wanted to find somebody that could help the club years later. And so they kind of looked at me and then one day eventually I did become vice president with the goal in mind to help facilitate the building of a museum. Okay. And so now we have the Colored Musicians Club uh, Museum in the lower level, a dream that came true. And uh, along with the board of directors, 
Okay. We now have that museum. Currently, uh, they're working on the development of an elevator and renovations of the upstairs club itself. That's where the history is. Uh, if you were a musician of color mm -hmm. and you had to play in the union, uh, they had a union there, 533, and then AFM absorbed it and uh, into Local 92, except the Colored Musician Club owned the building. Oh, okay. So that's why it is the oldest club in the United States. The oldest? Oldest, oldest club, club in the United States. Jazz club in the United States is wow. the Colored Musician Club because they owned the building and they did not lose it where everybody else did. Now. Until it, it, so it, in 2007, I wanted to move on to this question because it, it interests me so much. In 2007, you were awarded the Champion of Human Rights by the Youth for Human Rights International yes. on a world tour. Can you tell us about some of the human rights you've been involved in or are pushing for, rather? Well, a lot of things. For instance, when we go on tour, you hear about trafficking mm -hmm. of children and things of that nature. And so it placed me in a position to where, while I'm on tour, to keep an eye open for such things. And if I saw it or could affect it or somebody would hand me a note, then get it to the proper authority so they could go and rescue someone or something like that. You have to really be aware that somebody could be trying to tell you something, I'm in trouble, but you gotta be able to be aware enough to not blow it and get the proper authorities to them so that they can be rescued or something like that. So I've always stood up for that, yeah. human rights. And I'm thankful that you were in those key spots to help people who might have been trafficked and you were able to hopefully, you know, sound exactly. the alarm, exactly. if you will. Now, um, how do you see the, the scene in Buffalo's, you know, Buffalo's growing music scene, how do you see it changing? And well, what do you hope to see? Well, the thing is, is that you've got the Outer Harbor that's mm -hmm. growing. You had Canal Side uh, that has definitely blown up already. But also the, um, all the different festivals and how they're linked but the important part is is how it's perceived. Understood, yeah, okay. how it's perceived. How it's perceived, and the thing is is that from a political standpoint, it's about economics, and because people are able to see the connection of the economic growth of it, that having bands and singers and, and children and, and shows of that nature and concerts, how it, it comes down to the bottom line for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. For the entertainer itself, it is what you do. It is your living. It may not be the biggest living, but you do what you love and you love what you do. Right. And with that, you bring joy. Sure. So, so the, just to see that you would hope to see that the music scene continues to grow. It, it is. And take advantage of these wonderful things we have coming to Buffalo. And exactly. And, and just like even though we're in the time of COVID, I look for the day past it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how we move past Which it. Which kind of leads me to my next question, because recently you were, you were the organizer and marketing director for the Western New York's Veterans Day Parade. Yes. Um, when did you get involved with that? I've seen that happened, you know, previously. Yeah, well, it started by... Um, New York Senator Antoine Thompson. He felt that veterans need to be recognized, so I was on the very first parade committee. Okay, very first parade committee. committee and uh, that's going back, I think, 2008 to 2009. So this goes back quite a bit. And uh, from there, it kind of grew and then went down and grew and went down. Unfortunately, when it comes to veterans, people don't look at it the same way you would look at it as, say, St. Patrick's Day, mm -hmm. some beer and a leprechaun. <laughs> We don't have that. Mm -hmm. Or Santa Claus Parade, you got Santa Claus. Or the Easter Parade, you got the bunny. Uh, we have veterans that we try to honor and uh, bring awareness. And it's such a beautiful way to, to yes. bring the community together and, and bring, again, like you said, the awareness. Now, are you a veteran yourself? No, I'm not. I'm not a veteran. I'm a GSC, government service civilian. OK. And um, I've been that for quite some time. Um, I've never taken the oath. I wanted to take the oath, but my draft uh, sergeant had a better idea. But you so, did, in a way, service, yes. service us, so, so thank I you. So I went to Vietnam instead of with a gun, I went with a keyboard. For but sure. I also saw firsthand combat. I also saw our troops be out there listening to us today, and then tomorrow you're in the hospital and there's an arm and there's a leg blown off. Uh, the heads are wrapped up, so I witnessed that. You were able to and witness how, it firsthand. Firsthand of how a life could be changed in just 24 hours. I'm glad that you took that as motivation to continue to do good, though. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's what you have to do in that situation. And like, like I said, thank you for your service. Even going over there, it's certainly something that is dangerous, so thank you. Yeah. Um, now, the African-Americans Veteran Monument. 
that um, will be coming. Yeah, when it, what is that and, and when? Well, it's 2022. Uh, it will be built and uh, open to the public, but <clears throat> it's uh, it's dedicated to the people that have been in service to our country, African Americans, since the beginning of the country and every single war. Oh wow, that's what that's this is about. That's really powerful. Every it's, single it's very in depth. war. Because uh, a lot of times people aren't aware. They just see what they see on television. Mm -hmm. And most of the TV films don't show too many African Americans anywhere. You wouldn't even think there were anybody in the war. And been fighting for our country and yeah. so deserve something like and that. And many have died. Yes. Okay. But this way, we and can tell the story, tell the history, and educate everyone. That's the whole point, is to educate everyone and then highlight not only just African Americans, but everybody. Yeah, and so it's just a great way to honor uh, those who did serve. Those who did serve, and but educate. Educate. Yeah, I think that that's such a powerful thing to do is to educate and to remember those who served. Tell the history. Um, and tell, tell the, the story. Stories. One of the reasons why I started the Good Deeds Buffalo Show is I wanted to record people's existence while they were here. Yes. And the good that they do. So I'm glad that we're able to do that for you, Van. Well, thank and you. Everyone else we've had on the show, it, it is awesome. So well, thank like you. Well, like I said, I am truly now, honored. You can learn more about Van Taylor and how you can help him give back online at GoodDeedsBuffalo.tv. Now, would you like to get caught up on all the good events and news happening here in Western New York? Perfect. We'll be right back with Jordan's Good Events and News. Stay tuned.